I'm quite excited about this talk. Um, who knows about Blender? Who's used Blender? Who started programming Python because of Blender? <laughs> I, I came across Python because of Blender. Uh, I, I, was, I had a crap computer. Um, Blender was the only 3D software that ran on it, and um, it was the only thing that worked decently. And then I discovered this programming language in it called Python, and here I am at PyCon. So that was like 10 years ago. So I'm really excited about this talk. So take it away. Thanks. Thanks. OK, so first off, um, I was supposed to be using Python and Blender, but it's actually playing with Python and Blender. Whenever I use Python, it, it feels like I'm playing. It's not like when you're using Java or something, and you're like, oh, I'm really coding. It's just, it's fun. It's always, it's awesome. You know, I just, man, I love it. I absolutely love it. No, you said, oh, yeah. No, that's it. So go. There we go. This took way too long, and it looks crap, but it, you get the idea. Crazy little thing flying in. So what I was going to do at first is take you through the API, and then we'll see, you know, I can give you a basic idea of what actually, like, uh, how the API gets together and where you can find what you want. But you can see how much stuff that is in the slides that were there, so I thought, I'm not going to bore you to death because this is supposed to be fun. I mean, you know, we're going to play with Python and Blender. So we're just going to skip that and go straight into the computer and just get straight into scripts. Also, this is quite hands-on. It's a lot of Python. It's sort of like in your face because, well, it's PyCon. I'm going to see Python. So, well, once it turns around and it'll, it'll get to the computer. Here we go. Yeah, I couldn't think of anything better. Pseudocode. Python is almost like writing pseudocode. A lot of times you write stuff and you go, is this real code? Does this actually work? It's just beautiful. Okay, so first off, what I'm going to show, I'm going to show you guys three scripts, three scripts that I made. Um, it's obviously not all the ones. One of the ones I actually only came up with when I, when I had the idea to do PyCon. I was like, that'll be awesome. Anyways, the first one is a lot of droid. And I got the idea from um, the Jelly Bean one. Something fell. <laughs> from the Jelly Bean. Um, Android. We had jelly beans in his body. And I thought, this will be awesome, because I got an app that I made for a lot to check her, and I wanted to throw some balls in him. But now to make 49 balls and stick them all in there and everything, uh, it's probably going to take too long. So I came up with this idea. So yeah, let's have a look. Okay, I did the pre-recording, but I'm just going to show you live. I was warned not to, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because <laughs> live code is fun, man. Okay, so we're going to start off here. This is, uh, you can see on the side, where's my cursor? Then on the side, we've got the little script, which we'll look at in a bit more detail just now. And then on this side, I've got my little ball, and I'm going to drop it into that thing, which is basically like a little cone, and that's how it's going to look like this. Because Blender gives us all the physics. It does everything for us. you just got to do a few little things, set it up, and then it goes. So I created a ball. I did all the special stuff for the textures and everything, and I created all the uh, materials. And then, but I've only got one. And we're going to take this one, duplicate it many times, and then set everything up the way we want. So if we just quickly run this, it's not going to work. Obviously not. Ah, it worked. Cool. So now you'll see, now we've got a few more balls. And if we go into rendered mode, oh, yes, of course, that will not work. Damn it. That's why you don't do live. Okay, that's supposed to just have colors on. It doesn't have the colors on, but you get the idea. And uh, then what we're going to do is quickly activate. Oh, sorry. Go away. Go away. Yes. And then you can see. So we just, because I set it all up as a, um, it's called a rigid body. It does everything for you. It drops it in. And we can just quickly throw that thing away. And then go to a frame where it's all fallen. And there you go you got a little thing full of balls. Obviously, in the final one, okay, the colors, like I said, is wrong. But in the final one, I took some of the things and I just changed it so that I got more um, of the ball numbers actually facing you so it looks a bit better. So let's have a look at how we did this. It died. Sorry, it died. Okay, there we go. So first of all, you'll see you always go import BPY. BPY is basically all the cool stuff that's in BPY. There's three other ones which I haven't used, and so we're not going to cover those at all. And then I've got a little random, which I'll show you why I used it. So I set up a nice dictionary. Dictionaries are so much easier to use in Python. Have you tried to do that at the hash map in Java? Oh, my word. <laughs> OK, so 
<laughs> it's just, you know, it's very easy. So you can see we got numbers so that we know number one will give us this. Uh, what's the same? Give us the color because it's one to nine is gray and then, you know, like every six, seven, whatever the hell, balls change color. Okay, so then the rest of the script, we've got the update ball and the set the image, which you can see the bodies are removed. We'll see that in the next one. So we've got, um, I used this previous ball because you saw that it went from top to bottom. So every time that you place the next ball, you need to know where the last ball was. So, and then I just made a, a list quickly of uh, numbers and I shuffled those so that I get a random stack. Otherwise, it's one, two thingy and you get all the same colors bunching together and it just looks hilarious. Okay, so we shuffle that and we're going to set, uh, just loop through that. So first of all, what we do is you do this thing that you select all. Every time that you do something with Blender, uh, with Python, when you select an object and you copy it, duplicate it, or do something with it, it now selects the next one. And that's one thing that, that got me in the beginning. I'm like, what, but what, why did it select this? So it's kind of slightly different to when you're actually interacting with Blender. So what we do first is we deselect everything, so we've got nothing selected in the scene. Then we select the main one, which was the one ball that you saw. And then we're going to do, uh, well, we create a duplicate. And yeah, I'm using ops now. BPY ops, this is operators. But you're not actually supposed to do this if you're going to do a huge amount. Because what this does, uh, using operates, operators, um, if you're adding lots of objects, you add one, then it reads it. Then you add the second one, then it goes in the list of stuff it has to do. It's like a queue. Then it reads the two. Then you add the third one, then it reads one, two, three. So if you're adding 7,000 objects, you can see that's going to take really long. But because I'm only adding 49, I just went ahead and used ops. OK, so we select the ball, make the duplicate. Um, and then this, this little one was quite interesting, the context. Because now what will happen, like I said, as soon as I made the new object, I select this ball, I make a new object, the new object is now selected, not the previous one. And that's not something that I wanted. Um, oh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's fine, but we just needed to know the duplicate ball, you know, give me that object. And that's always the first one, so it's zero. And this is a little print line, and then there we call update ball. Okay, so an update ball, you can see I passed the ball, obviously the actual object, the mesh, um, what number I want, and the previous one, so I know where to place it. So then uh, we make a new material, and this, you can see, was my little uh, dict uh, yeah, the dictionary that I've got with the color, and I copy that. So I, I set all these things up previously, and they were there. Then we go uh, new material. I just, I get the stuff names. You know, I see a lot of times, like you go on blend swap or something, you get somebody else's blend file, and it says plane one, plane two, plane three, circle, ball, and you're like, what, what is this? And I think it's being a developer that's made me, I want to name stuff, because this is just, by, by, just a hobby. You know, I just got into Blender because it's fun. So I, I like to name stuff. You want to search for something, you know where to find. And yeah, it's probably because of that. Okay, so then we're going to say the active material for that ball is the new material that we just made. We set the image, which I'll show you just now. And then here we can see we just set the location. And I mean, it's, yeah, it's easy. Once, once you get that object, which is bpy.data.objects, you've got everything. You can get its location, you can get its material, you can get its um, animation, its keyframes. Basically, you think it. It's pretty much all in there. And then we return that, and yeah, that gets, oh, what am I, where am I going? My bad. <laughs> okay, so then we're going to set the image. Um, yeah, this, this was kind of a, a mission, and it took me a little while to find it. When I was done, it took me about three hours to do this, and I was like, you know, I could have actually just done it properly, or d done it manually, and you go, but I wrote a cool script, who cares? It was awesome. A lot of times, uh, developers, that's what we do. We make something, why did you do it? Because I can. <laughs> okay, so I had to search through the thing to find this, this image texture. It gives me the node, and then I just save that node, and I, I just exit there. And then what I do is I load the image. So obviously, now you don't have to go and load image by image by image, because there's lots. So you would have to go load image, select this one, because you can't select more than one. There's a little add-on in Blender that can do it, but yeah, normally you would do it one by one. Um, then we go, this one's image. We just set the actual image to the picture, and then once again, we name the thing. So once you go and you look in your um, outliner, it actually gives you all this stuff. Yes, I just need to check my time. Okay, so next up, I wanted to make the LSD logo. So this is what the actual logo looks like. This is an SVG. And um, yeah, being a Blender fundy or a Blender crazy person, I always want to make everything in 3D, everything. It's like, this is cool. Let's make it 3D. Why? Because I can. So I wanted to make this thing in 3D. But you can imagine, placing those many blocks, why would anybody do this? So. Okay, yeah. So that, that is one of the, the what's-the-same's that I made. You can see these little, um, th those are the ice cubes, and that's actually what this is made of. But you don't see it as nicely, obviously, because it's very small, so that's why I put the bigger one there. 
Or we could make something like this, like a little crazy animation. And you can see these has got these crazy, I don't know what those are, but sometimes you make something you're like, that looks cool, what is it? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so here we've got, this This is a bit of a bigger script. This one took me quite a bit longer to do and to actually get right and to get perfect because there's all sorts of stuff like here to go and drill down into getting all the children, all sorts of stuff like this. So uh, yeah, you can see that's the run, obviously, which is gonna be the main one. We're gonna make the objects. Uh, we're going to modify the view. Uh, parenting is very important. We're going to select, find all the duplicates. You can see unselect all I put in there, so you can just see what it looks like. That's just once again, you select, unselect, select, unselect. Uh, placing the thing and then changing the angle. And the reason I put the angle in, um, you're going to put like a couple of ice cubes in. You don't want all the ice cubes to look exactly the same. Then you've got this thing that looks exactly the same. So you can put in like 10 or something objects, and then it'll automatically select all of those objects, select a random one, change it, the, the orientation of it, and then make it, just to give you a bit more of a, a nicer looking uh, logo. Okay, so in Create Objects, we first, first what we have to do is find children. So what this does, you guys saw, I've got bubbles. So I've got this ice cube that I made, and then I gave that thing little bubbles that you have in a second layer that you could do cool compositing stuff with. And the reason I did this well, on the second layer is to do the compositing, but also you parent it to this thing. So when you take the ice block and you move it, everything moves together. Otherwise, you have, you've got to select this thing and then select this thing and then select this thing. But obviously, that makes it, when you want to copy it, impossible because now you've forgot about the children. So then you have all the ice blocks and you've got no bubbles. You go, oh, I need bubbles. <laughs> what was that? Finding Nemo. Bubbles! <laughs> okay, so. So what we do is, first of all, we find all the objects, so, so the duplicates. Um, here what I did is when I passed it in, this object name, I uh, called the one LSD and I called the other one Tux, because Tux is obviously the um, uh, penguin. So that would just find all the objects that's called LSD, and then that's so that you could put in one object, or you could put in 20, or you could put 50, so that you have lots of different looking things. And um, yeah, so then we just go through the duplicates. The mod view I didn't put in here. All I do there is I just change it uh, when you have like thousands of objects on a screen that's got all these cool modifiers on that looks really nice, your scene gets slow and you can't work with it. So what that does is that just puts off all those co uh, cool things so you don't see it in the viewport, but you do see it in the render so that your scene is fast again. So that, yeah, that's just one little line. Um, and then what I did is the children of the duplicate, we just do the same thing. We just loop through this duplicate's children and obviously get all the children and then we do the same thing for all the children. And then continuing in the sub, go, aha. Um, we get the verts. The verts is basically where we're going to place them. So what I did originally is I made an SVEG logo, and then I would just quickly, obviously, use Python, open it up, find all the little blocks that I had, get all the locations, and save that. And then save that for LSD and save it for tux. So I had two different ones. And then that just gives us this, so that we don't, obviously, place it manually. Okay. And then we get the length. The length, I did that just to make sure that I don't well, that I start with the first ones and then only duplicate the amount that I need. So if I need 100 objects and I've got 20, I only duplicate 80. You don't make more than what you need. Yeah. Okay, and then we go through the, the locations and uh, through these duplicates and we place these first. And then what I would do is also, once again, this little context. Um, when you in Blender and you've got lots of objects and you select everything and you then do parent, there's the last object you select that's got like slightly a different color and that one is the active object. But when you do it through Python, there's no such thing. And then you get some sort of an error. I'm like, what? So then I found out that this is, yeah, you just got to do that, just set the little active. And uh, once again, we do the parenting, which is where you have all the objects sitting in one little object. I'll show you that little screen just now. And then once again, we deselect everything before we start with anything else. And the vert was pretty much, um, yeah, we just select the random of the duplicates. Like I say, you can have one or 20. So we want to select whichever one, take that one, duplicate that one, Get all, well, yeah, uh, get all of its children, select all of its children, and then once again, you can see I used ops. But it's not that many objects, and it actually goes pretty fast. And I didn't even know at this point I wasn't supposed to use ops. It's only when I made the next one I realized this is going too slow. And then I read up, because you know, it's like you first code and then read the API. Well, that's what I do. Documentation, who uses that? <laughs> so, um, then we, where was I? Yes, yeah, so then we find, once again, we find that object, and we place it. So we would just obviously get the vert and then place it in the spot that we need it. And then we parented everything. So every time that I did the parent is you just select all the objects and you just parent it to the main one, which you can see, yeah. I select, unselect everything. So, uh, and then once again, yeah, th this, this is quite a nice one. You can check uh, if it has an attribute called child because obviously that's just a dictionary. If it doesn't have it, it doesn't have children. If it does, select them. 
and then make a given action object and set the parents. Oh yeah, the place, you can see here the place duplicate, I think I showed, the, oh no, I didn't show this one. Um, this would set, set the vert, but the rotation Euler is where you would give it an angle. The random angle is the one that I showed you. So yeah, I said zero, zero random angle, because in this case the bubbles were sitting on a vertical plane, and if you turn it in a different direction, your bubbles look odd. So this one I only basically rotated around the uh, Z axis. And then that's just a little clip that I made. I was still supposed to add sounds, and I just never got there. Did you get the idea? <laughs> Wait, actually, I wanted to quickly just show you. Oh, little thingy there. No. Okay, so this is the actual scene. You can see in this case, here we've only got, we've got uh, little blocks. You can see some of them has got these, um, what's the name set on? There, you can see that one doesn't look like an ice cube, but this one does. And that's just because this little thingy in the, what's his name, has been set off. Uh, why don't you work? Oh, it doesn't want to work. Anyways, so what you're going to do is you just select this, run the script, and you, oh, okay, no, this is the wrong one. Oops. This is the Python one, and I couldn't get the thing to line up. This is actually the file that's on GitHub, but uh, so it makes a Python logo instead of the LSD logo. What I want to show you is all these little crazy black lines that you get. You can see that's, that's the main object. So if I take that object and I move it, uh, everything moves together, and that's why we do parenting, so that you don't have seven million objects in your view. Sorry, this is one hand. Yeah, so you can see on the side, this is the, the thing that's called the outliner. And when you open it up, there you've got a ton of objects. And then also just make sure that this is clean. Because when you get to a, a complex scene, you've got seven billion things, and you go, oh, I don't know what I'm looking for. And then you've got one of these things, and then it just makes everything really difficult. So that's the reason for parenting. Cool. No, don't play that again. Okay. So then the last one was Lego Water. Who's seen the Lego movie? Who loved the Lego movie? i got kids. No, I loved it, even, it doesn't matter that I have a kid, but yeah. Well, that, that's how I feel. When you're doing stuff with Python and Blender, everything is awesome until you get stuck at 3 o'clock in the morning. Then it's not so awesome. Okay, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I wanted to make this little scene. This is a much smaller version. My computer could not render this thing. It died. So this is the, the, the biggest scene that I could make. And um, so I had to come up with a very cheap, dirty, hacky method to render this. This is actually a viewport render. It's not an actual render. So in the viewport, when it does the slight little render, it doesn't even get complete, and then I would just say that. But just to give you the idea of what the water looked like. Because yeah, I, when I saw the movie, they had this huge ship and they had all this water, and I was like, obviously this is CGI. I want to do that. And um, yeah, this, this was also the biggest script that I did, and I actually think I learned the most doing this one. And this is where I realized, don't use ops. So, okay, we can quickly see we got creating the objects, duplicating the objects, parenting the objects. Uh, we're not going to use remove that. That was just while I was testing. And then obviously unselect all, as always. Okay, is there any water here? Can I just drink this? Jeez. I don't know whose this is, but it's delicious. Okay. Ah, okay, so what do we, yeah, we unselect everything. So first of all, yeah, first, first of all, what I had to do is I only made one little Lego block. I'm not going to like, you know, make millions. So make one little Lego block, take that, duplicate that many times, create it in a nice little row so everything sits there. And then finally, we did the what I called the water impression, where we would actually get all the, the verts and then once again make it, you know, look like water or make it at least animate like that. So first of all, we're going to make the objects. So I would go bpy.data. Data is the one that holds all the stuff, basically. If you're looking for something, um, Inside data, you'll find like there's objects, uh, and one, one, once you got this object, that's where you got all those um, extra things. Now I forgot what I was saying. Anyways, so once again, we're gonna. You see, here we've got the object. We set the subsurf. The subsurf is basically the one that I didn't show in the last one. Um, that's you know where it looks, where it gives it that really beautiful look, but it makes your, your scene very slow. So there, what I do is I just say show viewport false, you know, so that that you don't see it. So your scene is faster, even though that big scene that you saw. Even on my machine at home, which is a pretty decent machine, you move it and it goes like it barely freaking worked. It's like, why would I make such a big scene? Anyways, 
So what, we, what I did first of all is I've got two loops, so one to loop across and then one to loop down. So I'd place, I'd one little object and then I'd just quickly place that. And you can see I also have got this last little thing that I would just see which one sits where and then quit. And then here the difference is, um, I'll show you in duplicate object, I did not use ops, so yeah, to do a context scene update. And that is so that you can actually put in 2,500 objects and your computer doesn't take you know, seven years. So in the duplicate object, this is where I would make a copy of the object. So instead of actually using ops and saying duplicate, you copy the object. Then you set the data. Oh, well, uh, yeah, we, we also copied the, the data of the object. I would place the object, find the, the axis, um, and then obviously, yeah, what you have to do is you have to link it to the scene. Because if you don't link it and you update the scene, there's going to be nothing. And um, yeah, I kind of forgot to link it. So where's all this stuff? Anyways, so once you link it, there you go. Do the parenting. Once again, so you've got one object that you can move. In this case, it wasn't very important to move it because I wasn't actually going to use it in anything else. And then we just return that. And um, yes, this is the water impression script. So this was a different script because in, inside Blender you can have like many different scripts and you can switch the stuff and whatnot. So once again, I would select all the duplicates. Everything was called Lego Circle because, well, it's a Lego Circle. Uh, we would up insert the keyframes because this is where we did the animation. Um, removing, I didn't use this, it was just in testing, so we're going to look at that. And then getting the ocean verts, which was the interesting bit. I first want to show you like how, where did I get this from? Can you see Lego water? Where is my cursor? Aha. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, the, the Lego block will be fine. Um, yes, of course, hold on. Okay, I don't think the water's in there. Aha, there we go. Okay, so uh, Blender's got this cool thing called a ocean modifier. Yeah. So you just insert a little thing, you can change some settings. I didn't bother too much to make this look too realistic because you know, it's Lego, it's supposed to just be fun and look like water. So what I did with this object is I, I selected that, I would go through the keyframes, make that a mesh, get the height map from it, and then apply that to mine. No, no, that, that's all in Blender. You just, that's the modifier, you just add, you go, make it ocean, play, and then it goes. There's all these cool parts in physics and stuff. It does fire, it does, it does everything. That's awesome. What's that? Yes, yes, yeah. No, that, that's, I just wanted to just show you where, where it comes from. Sorry, this is actually made for a dual screen, but you get the idea. So what I wanted to show you is I've got this little thing. And then I've got a modifier here called array. And when you change this array, it does that. So you can see now, obviously, it's got more. You know, can five, you can set it five, 12, and you can animate that and obviously set that from your code. And that's how we got it. So I made one object, made sure I set the array, did everything to it, and then just duplicated that. And you can see here's that little thing. If you click that, okay, you don't really see it there. But now that shows this, and that's what I did in the viewport. Oops. There we go. I should actually look there. That's easier. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. I need to point. Okay, so we're going to inf insert the frames. Uh, what I did is, yeah, the ocean verts, get the ocean verts. That is where I would just loop through that object and actually get all the heights. Um, in this case, it was 251. I think that's supposed to be 50. Oh, no, sorry, no. That, that's the frame count. So I did it over 10 seconds. So what I would do is select uh, the, the object, I'll deselect everything. Then I would select the scene so we know which scene we want to work with, um, and then set the frame to I. So you can see I stepped in 10. So you only set every 10 frames. With, with Blender, you don't set every single frame. You set one thing here. Then you move on 10 frames and you set something else. And you can play it. And then Blender fills in the gap for you in between. Okay. So then we went through the duplicates. Um, here what I did is I added five and I was just playing with it a bit to see. Because what happens is the ocean actually dips below zero. 
and then if you don't do a, an addition, then you get this flat looking thing, and I couldn't understand what was going on until I just quickly ran through it and I realized, oh, you know, it goes underneath. So that's also why it starts a bit higher. Um, and then we would just get the ocean verts, which is obviously what we got from the ocean. Um, set the, you can see here's the modifiers. We set the array count to the count, which we got. Because yeah, I just used the count. I mean, it's actually like 27 pixels high and you're like, 27 is the array, that works. And uh, set the active material, uh, so that they all look the same. And then the modifiers key, key um, uh, the, the array, I would insert this. So the keyframe when you insert is so that it'll make sure at that frame that it'll actually remember, you know, when you do the animation, that that's what it should be at. So that you could change it to two in this one and then eight in that one, and then you'll get this thing that goes up and down. Okay, yeah, the get ocean verts. Yeah, what I did basically is you can see this thing was called ocean, so data to objects again. We would go, uh, I just had an entity list called uh, lines, and then once again, we set it first to the first uh, frame, and then I would make a new mesh. I would go this object to mesh, and then just give it, make that thing a mesh. Because at that point, it's not. It's a modifier, and it's a special thing, so you can't get any information from it. So I just cheated and just made a copy of it at that, at that frame, and then I would just loop through it and get all those three vertices that I would then apply to my other one. And this is, uh, what's the sound I was going to go through? I think I've got a few minutes. Not really. Um. Mm. So this is API. Context you guys saw. Context is basically where your cursor is. Uh, you'll get caught with that if you're just trying to run a script from some random thing and then it says context is incorrect. And you go, what do you mean it's incorrect? And that means your cursor was supposed to be in the 3D uh, screen and now it was in a different screen. Because each time that you put your cursor in a different one of those windows, shortcut keys work differently because your context is completely different. Uh, data access, like I said, every all the cool stuff sits in data where you can access just the mesh. So when you go into edit mode and you see all the little dots, like how you build a thing, or you can get the entire object with all of its uh, the materials and everything on. Um, uh, the rest is not really interesting. The handles is kind of cool, and I'll show you that. What I did with that viewport render for the Lego water, I had to attach a handle. Uh, when I first found that out when I was doing this, I was like, this is so cool. This is the coolest thing slice since sliced bread. But you've got to be careful when you play with handles. Be before you know it, you would have put too many on, and your computer goes, and it just dies. And uh, there's a way to do it persistently as well, so then when you open it up, it keeps dying. Luckily, I didn't do that. But once you close it, usually all that stuff is lost and it's out. Okay, this is a, uh, uh, yeah, you see this, this was the other, the standalone models were modules, which is not in BPY, but I haven't actually used any of these and this is going into uh, OpenGL directly, that you can do all sorts of cool stuff. I don't know math that well. Okay, and then we've got the game engine modules, which I've not really worked with, so we're just gonna skip past those. And you can see here's the context. You see, we've like, we got a view 3D, we've got a screen content, we've got a global content, buttons content, all sorts of stuff. Uh, BPY data, you can see this is like where you get the meshes, the objects, you can get your scene, because you can have multiple scenes set up, uh, multiple screens, textures, fonts, because you can, um, yeah, the one thing about uh, Blender is it doesn't load your fonts, your system fonts. So when you start off, you have no fonts. You always have to go load the font and then find the font. So that'll obviously tell you about the specific one. Uh, here's all the operators. You can see, I can actually show you this. Whenever you do something in Blender, you've got this little thing that you can pull down. Well, you can see that's over there. And that gives you all the cool stuff. It's kind of like recording a macro. So as you're working with a scene and doing stuff to whatnot, and then you can see that it actually tells us what it did. So that's kind of cool, but a lot of times you're not going to use the operators, so it's not that useful. But uh, every now and then it's kind of cool. But the biggest cool, uh, the, the very nice thing about this is whenever you hover over something, it always gives you the bpy.data.scenes. So it's kind of nice if you like, okay, so how do I get this? Oh, yes, it's there. Okay, excellent. Yes, basically it shows you if you wanted to animate or use this, this radiance, you would go bpydata.scenes, scenes. Okay, well, it's cut off there a little bit. But so uh, that's actually something that's on by default, which is kind of cool. Well, if you're using Python, a lot of people don't care. So what am I going to do with Python? <laughs> everything. That's what you got to do with Python. Everything. <laughs> okay, so then we got types. Uh, types. I wasn't supposed to go over this. I think I'm out of time. I'm just going to skip to this one. This is the cool one. Okay, so the handles is the one that I set up. 
every time that the uh, scene would render, okay, yeah, you, you would have a render pre and a render post. These renders off your viewport and those renders off your actual render when you hit render and, you know, this, the thing's rendering. So what I did is I set up a handler when the render post is done, it will call my, like a callback function, and my callback function would just do a little thing. It would just do a screen grab and it would just save that. It saved in all the stuff that I could make that ugly looking animation. Um, yeah, those we're not really going to care about. Cool, yeah, and then, then for that very short little animation that I spent way too much time on, there's a couple of uh, cool stuff I got from blendswap.com. If you're into Blender, go to that site. They've got very cool models. Uh, there's just a couple of those listed. And that's it. Very cool. Thanks for that. Any questions? Yes. Someone's coming with a microphone just to make sure we get it uh, on the recordings. Thanks. So I last used Python with Blender about seven or eight years ago. And at the time, I ran into some issues where some of the operations you can perform from sort of the menus in Blender, there was no Python equivalent to it. It sort of went directly into the Blender internals. Uh, yeah, basically, as far as I understand, everything that you can do in Python, like in Blender, you can do through Python. Oh. It's, it's basically just combining for everything. Um, it changed very big uh, when the 2.5 series came out, which was about 2010, 2011, and they redesigned the entire thing. Like, I did the whole Noob 2 Pro, and I could use 2.4 very well, and then 2.5 came out, and they changed everything you go. <laughs> but obviously, there's a lot of cool stuff that they changed. There's one thing that they forgot, um, and that's if you want to set your origin point, there's no button for it, and you have to press Control, Alt, Shift, C. But I mean, it's a shortcut you will not forget. <laughs> so, but apparently, yeah, there's there's buttons for most of the stuff. But I mean, yeah, you can you can access everything through through Python. A lot of the stuff is written in Python. Um, I think when I checked last, it was about 50 or 60 percent of it is Python. It runs on Cython. So basically, yeah, there's lots of Python in, in Blender. And all the new stuff that gets added, you you can actually go look at the stuff. It's all Python. There's some stuff that they do in C, obviously for the Cython stuff. But uh, most, most of it is Python. All your modifiers and stuff, you can literally just go into Blender's folder, find all the Python things, check the modifiers and see. You just start ripping out code and playing with that. I uh, got kind of lost in that for about three days, and then I'm like, okay, let me just get focused. <laughs> Sounds good. I don't, I don't know which version of Blender it had it, but there was a tool where you can create your button, place the button where you want, in which menu you want, and it seems to have disappeared at least as of uh, 268. So, I mean, sorry, 68, whatever it is. Yeah, I'm actually not sure about that. I could look it up and let you know, but I haven't actually tried to like make little menus and stuff. I know that uh, you can, when you write your own scripts, you can make UI components and stuff, yeah, but I haven't actually tried that. There's so, I mean, there's so many features to Blender. It's useful for you to be able to make your own buttons or your own shortcuts and yeah. the shortcuts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, so you're saying you can generate your own custom UI inside Blender from a Python script? Yeah, yeah. you, you could literally, um, there's all these add-ons that you can find in Blender. You just go into the, the system, uh, system settings and then add-ons, and there's a huge set of stuff that you can find. And then once you get that and you activate it, then it's usually got your 3D view on, on your editing side. It comes up there with the little menus, like uh, it's called meta menus. And then you've got all sorts of extra stuff, and that, that you can make yourself. Any other questions? So I have a question. Um, last time I actively used Python is, is year, oh, sorry, Blender is years ago. Um, and back then, they, it was before everything was open sourced as, uh, mm. from Blender, and they had the game environment in there that was, they were trying to commercialize that. How active, how much development is going on in that game environment? And is anyone, because you have the full power of Python inside a Blender, is anyone trying to um, build a system where, because you're using Python, you could collaboratively work on a 3D world inside your editor? Because obviously, everything is driven inside Blender from Python. Mm. Is there ways to, to collaborate inside an environment with someone remotely? Well, the thing is, the Blend file is saved as an XML, so you could just have them get repo, and then, you know. Um, but I mean, in, in real time, is anyone looking at that kind of stuff? I'm not sure. I don't okay. think so. But the, the game development's gone quite far. It's got, come a long way. Uh, they've added all sorts of cool stuff. I haven't actually looked at it as much, but I know when I looked at the difference between 2.4 and 2.5, it's, it's added quite a lot. And you now get the Android, uh, it's called the, the Blend Play or the Droid Play or something. So you can make a, Android, uh, a game in Blender and then compile it for your Android device. 
Very cool. And obviously, we're using Python. Any last questions before we wrap up? No? Okay. Thank you very cool. much. Thanks. Thanks for your lovely presentation. Um,